sure you feel it coming. There's something on the breeze. It might be slightly snowing or 70 degrees. Regardless of your hemisphere, the holidays are here. And with them come the tidings of this special time of year. A bucket of fried chicken, a costume for your dad, a demon who will stuff you in a sack if you've been bad. A reindeer gets promoted, an old man confronts his fear of karma and mortality. The special... <sighs> The holiday season is upon us once again. You know, it's times like this I often think of a very famous poem. Christmas, Christmas, Christmas. Oh, Christmas, you Christmas, you Christmas. C-H-I, no, wait, C-H-R-I-S-T-M-A-S. -S. Truly, more powerful words have never been spoken. Welcome to the third annual Glad and Gladiator Christmas episode, which brings us to a bit of an issue. See, I thought for sure by now y'all would have run me off the internet for my lukewarm takes. Oh well, guess I'll just have to try harder next year. Though, to be honest, I've had quite a bit of difficulty getting into the spirit this time around, mainly because, to me, this feels like the first Christmas of the rest of my life. What I mean is it's the first one since I've entered the quote-unquote real world, the first one where I'm only going to have a few days to spend with my family, and everything just feels... different so I haven't really been able to think of a festive topic for this video. I need to call Vic. He'll know what to do. Vic! Yo, what's up? Vic, I need your help. It's a matter of life and death. Oh shit, what's happened now? I'm filming my Christmas video and I don't have a festive topic to discuss. Well, does it have to be Christmas themed? Couldn't it just be something nostalgic that makes you have a similar feeling? Like a mid-2000s edutainment game console that was discontinued 12 years ago? Well, that's oddly specific. Why did that come to mind? <laughs> no reason. That's right, to end off the year, we're going to be looking back at one of my favourite childhood accessories, the V-Smile. Specifically looking at the games made for the thing by Disney Interactive. Originally released on August 4th, 2004, the V-Smile was a product from the electronics company VTech, designed primarily for ages 3 to 6 to assist with learning and development. Despite being from the 6th generation of home consoles, yes, this was technically a competitor in the console wars, it still used cartridge technology, or as they called them, Smartridges. This little hunk of junk has always held a special place in my heart ever since me and my sister first unwrapped it on Christmas morning of 2006. Despite the fact by this point I had a PlayStation 2 and was playing games like Simpsons Hit and Run, something about this thing had me enamoured, yet even today I couldn't quite pinpoint what it was. I played it for a long time too. I first got it when I was 5 and stopped playing about when I was 10 or 11, then my family gave away our console as well as all our games to a family friend and I proceeded to play it every time I went over to his house. Over the years, I've often found myself thinking of the V-Smile and just how bizarre my love for it truly was. I mean, as a kid, I had every other major gaming console, yet I kept coming back to this. Part of me did want to get a hold of one again to try and understand it, but I couldn't find a valid reason to drop a bunch of money on an old, cheaply made video game system for preschoolers from 15 years ago. That was before I had a YouTube channel where I could monetize my morbid fascination, so... Cracking open this ancient relic, we have the console. And you can clearly see why whenever I try and explain what this thing is to my friends, I describe it as sort of like a Nintendo 64 if it was made by Fisher-Price. Though being honest, I find this design incredibly charming. The orange and purple are such a nice colour combination, I love this compartment in the back where you can store up to 6 games, and how the on and off buttons are distinguished by a sun and moon respectively. It's very cute. Next up, the controller, simply known as the joystick, which is a name I can get behind since this thing is massive. Now these things came in two variants, normal and girl. I'm fairly sure when I was a kid I found this quite alright to use, and on the box you see a kid holding the stick with one hand and using his other to completely grip the controller, which doesn't really feel comfortable. You could tell the company didn't design this controller with nostalgic 21 year olds in mind. 
definitely a bit of oversight on their part. Fresh out of the box, the V-Smile requires three size C batteries. But hold on there, because you can also get the official V-Smile 9 volt adapter, which thankfully came in the bundle I got, but for people in 2004, you had to buy it separately at an additional cost of $7.99 on top of the $60 for the console. Then there's the games. V-Smile launched with 10 smartridges, which varied in price. By which I mean the standard educational games were $16.99, and the licensed games, aka the ones kids actually wanted to play were $18.99. Because playing Care Bears isn't a right, it's a privilege. So with the console, an adapter, some games, and a spare controller because most games have a two-player mode, you'd easily be looking at a price tag of over 150 for this. Notice how I'm refusing to state a currency so as to avoid alienating my international audience. Today we're going to be covering five games by Disney Interactive based on features by Walt Disney Animation Studios. The first game I'm going to play is Disney Disney's Mickey Mouse Mickey's Magical Adventure released in 2004. And now, because the Smartridges have a very limited space, not allowing room for elongated story cutscenes, we get a throwback to the old school days with video game manuals. Now, they're not anything spectacular, just a story synopsis and instructions on how to play with screenshots taken from the game. But I won't lie and say there isn't some kind of novelty to these things. Enough about that, what about the game itself? Disney Disney's Mickey Mouse Mickey's Magical Adventure follows Mickey journeying on a quest to find Pluto after accidentally enchanting one of his bones while showing Minnie some magic. But to retrieve his best friend, Mickey will have to journey into the castle. Oh gosh, he must have gone to the castle! Throughout the levels, you'll be spelling words, solving logic puzzles, doing maths, because this is how I'm spending Christmas, apparently. Now, I actually have quite the history with this game. Despite owning it when I was a kid and playing it constantly, perhaps the most of any V-Smile game, I never actually beat it. Both because the game was very difficult for seven-year-old me, and it's just very long compared to other V-Smile games. It was easily one of the most ambitious games on the console with simply how large the levels are and how it actually tries to be a video game with enemies and ways to fail. And visually, the game looks nice. Of course, the V-Smile is not a very powerful system, so the graphics aren't going to astound anyone, but for what it is, it's pretty good. Mickey looks like Mickey, and there's some nice animations. It's clear a lot of care was put into the crafting of this game. Too bad it's not very good. For context, I, being the emotionally well-balanced 21-year-old I am, decided to play the game on difficult because, well, I graduated high school, I'm fairly sure I could handle this. What I wasn't anticipating was rather than simply including more advanced words to spell, this game did the worst kind of difficult mode, which included some of the most bullshit enemy placement I have ever experienced. This isn't helped by the fact the game often asks for very precise jumps and platforming. Things that the console wasn't designed with in mind. This was frustrating at the start, but by around the third level, it became near unplayable. So the level is based on Mickey and the Beanstalk, and involves you completing number sequences in order to make the Beanstalk grow. How you do this is by shooting magic at the clouds above your head with the correct answer. Simple enough, but the level features these bee enemies that fly above you and will home in on you if you are in their line of vision. And the game loves placing these guys on top of the clouds you have to hit. So while trying to dispatch of it, you'll often hit the wrong answer which will cause you to be struck by lightning. That wouldn't be too big of an issue if these levels didn't feel like they dragged on forever, especially the first one. In every section, you have to spell a word by finding the torches with the letters and lighting them in the correct order. Then move on to the next room, which looks exactly the same. And each of these levels only has one piece of music which by about the half hour mark really starts to get old, which merely added to what was feeling like endless torment. Most V-Smile games take about 40 to 50 minutes to get through, 
This one took me nearly three hours. Whether that says more about me or this game is up to you, but that doesn't change the fact I didn't have fun with this. I can fully understand why I was never able to finish this game, because even all these years later, it still felt like a gauntlet. But I guess it's par for the course for every game based on Fantasia to be needlessly frustrating. I will say, once I finally made it to the end, I felt very accomplished, because I had finally done it. After 17 years, I had at last completed this game, which also meant I never had to play it again. Well, needless to say, that's not what I was expecting, and it definitely set a negative tone going into the rest of these games. Maybe all these years I've been looking at the V-Smile through rose-tinted glasses, when in actuality, it's nowhere as good as I remember it being. Thankfully, the next game I played was Disney Princess Disney's The Little Mermaid Ariel's Majestic Journey which was a far more simple and far less frustrating experience. See, now why do all these titles sound like poorly translated Japanese games from the 90s? Ariel's Majestic Journey is a collection of minigames that loosely follows the plot of The Little Mermaid. Whether it's searching for musical instruments, matching objects in Ariel's cavern, picking up stuff from the kingdom's marketplace, or trying on dresses. Each activity is quick to the point and doesn't overstay its welcome, which made it far much easier to enjoy. Because the game omits combat entirely, simply having you avoid enemies and hazards, the controls were nowhere near as frustrating, and every time I ran into something, it definitely felt like my fault and not the game's. Now since this isn't a platformer, you might be wondering what the action button does since we can't jump. Well, pushing it will give Ariel a short burst of speed, which made the underwater sections a lot easier, but this action is maintained on land during the market level, which was the most fun I had making this project so far. I will say this is when you can really start to tell how limited the space on the Smartridge really is especially when the kingdom seems to be entirely populated by the same six people. Which does make this world feel significantly empty, but because you'll never be spending more than 10 minutes in any area, it doesn't really have the chance to get tiresome. Though it makes you wonder how did they come up with some of this stuff? Like, the minigame that takes place when Ariel makes the deal with Ursula is a game of Simon. Okay. Okay. As for the design, it's such a nice looking game for the V-Smile. It's all very vibrant and colourful, and does well enough translating the designs from the film. Despite Sebastian not appearing, and King Triton looking malnourished, the game is able to fit in a decent number of references, such as all the various sea creatures from under the sea making a cameo. Overall, this was a pleasant little experience. It's nothing mind-blowing, but I had my fun with it, and at the very least, didn't regret playing it. It's a fine game for kids who just want to swim around and hear Ariel tell them they did a good job. Hooray! You did it! Wow! Now, the next game I looked at was a rather interesting case, because it was the only one in the bundle I didn't have as a kid, and thus had no nostalgia for it whatsoever. That being said, Disney's Aladdin, Aladdin's Wonders of the World was the most competent and, dare I say, fun game I played up to that point. Did not see this one coming. Similar to Ariel's Majestic Journey, Aladdin's Wonders of the World is a heavily abridged retelling of the movie. And when I say abridged, I mean Genie's only appearance in the game is on the pause menu which wasn't terrifying whatsoever. Where Mickey's magical adventure felt very tedious and Ariel's majestic journey felt a little too simple, this one strikes a great middle ground with more involved and creative level design that isn't hindered by unfair difficulty spikes. Though it's still a V-Smile game with its amusing little quirks. Like how if you hold down the joystick and press the action button, Al does a little roll and maybe I was a little delirious due to the lack of sleep, but this was the funniest thing in the world when I first saw it. This is also the first game where I have nice things to say about the music, because here the music actually feels like Aladdin, even weaving in what sounded like a few pieces of the actual songs. I never got tired of listening to the soundtrack here, which very likely boosted my enjoyment of the overall game. As for the levels themselves, there's seven, with a wide variety of gameplay. Each one will have you answer five questions to move on to the next section, while picking up golden apples along the way for 
reasons. Though after the first few sections, it all does start to look the same, they do add enough things to keep it tolerable. Hot coals you have to jump over, ropes you have to climb, shimmy or zipline down, and enemies dropping cartoonishly large vases on top of you because god forbid we show any swords in this game. This also means Aladdin doesn't have any form of attack, and like Ariel, simply has to avoid all the hazards. So far, Mickey is the only character that's been allowed to commit manslaughter, and honestly, good for him. Nevertheless, this was the first game I played that I can wholeheartedly declare as kinda good. And if I was ever forced to play it again at gunpoint, I doubt I'd complain. Even though for a game called Aladdin Wonders of the World, there sure aren't a lot of wonders of the world. Even the carpet ride, which in the film does actually go all around the world, merely stays in Agrabah. But I guess by this point they'd already had magical adventure as well as majestic journey, and Aladdin's sublime escapade wasn't quite rolling off the tongue. Aladdin and Jasmine live happily ever after. Well that was a nice surprise. Up next on the chopping block, we have Disney Princess Cinderella's Cinderella's Magic Wishes. Oh boy. Now, this game is arguably a retelling of the first film, but it also isn't. What I mean is, like Ariel's Majestic Journey, this one is also a collection of minigames that vaguely resemble scenes from the film. Though this time there's the added element of a checklist that we complete as we go. And once we check off every item, both us and Cinderella will become full-fledged princesses. Well, it's about damn time. Said activities that will help us become a true princess involve being a servant to your abusive stepfamily, baking cakes, and helping chickens cross broken bridges. Funny, I don't seem to recall any of that in the Princess Diaries. To truly set the tone of this game, we can take a look at the first level. Anastasia wants ice cream, and you have to get it to her before it melts by finding a door labelled with the answer to the maths question. But don't take too long, or else the ice cream will melt. But also, don't go too fast, because you'll lose your balance and fall. You also then have to watch out for Lucifer, who chases the mice back and forth through the hall while Cinderella does nothing like the great friend she is. Then once you finally deliver to Anastasia, having found your way through this labyrinth of a house, Lady Tremaine decides that she wants ice cream, which is just such a great visual to imagine this creature with a Mr. Whippy. There's other levels which mix things up, like one where you control Gus while he's looking for corn, reminiscent of that one scene. One where Cinderella and the prince decide to steal Ariel and Eric's thunder as we learn the pumpkin carriage is a multi-terrain vehicle. Then there's rhythm games based around singing and dancing, which I sort of got the hang of. But the best activities in this game are the dress and cake ones, where after you follow the instructions of how to make a dress and a cake, you are given free range to decorate it however you want. After spending the previous few hours with these games holding my hand, telling me exactly where to go and refusing to let me stray from the one true path, I was suddenly given all these freedoms and it was exhilarating. I tried to make loss but it didn't work. My dress on the other hand was a masterpiece, though I wasn't expecting Cindy to bring her own gloves which ruined the whole ensemble. The only other thing of note is that like Genie, the fairy godmother does not appear in this game whatsoever. Instead whenever you complete a task, things just start to randomly materialise in front of you. Leading to my fan theory that the Cinderella in this version of events is an omnipotent being who can reshape the universe to her will if she so desired. But yeah, great game. Though I completed this entire checklist and did not become a princess. <laughs> so we have only one more game to look at, and I have saved the best until last, because this used to be my absolute favourite game as a kid. So without further ado, let's take a look at Disney's Winnie the Pooh The Honey Hunt. Finally a normal fucking title around here! I've talked about Winnie the Pooh on the channel a few times, but I don't think I'll ever be able to explain how deep my love for these characters truly goes. Of all the bears I developed an emotional attachment to as a child, he will always be my second favourite. Uh, I can explain. 
So you can see why more than any other I was most excited to revisit this game and immediately from the moment I turned it on I was hit with a massive wave of nostalgia as all the memories came flooding right back. The ice level where you slip along frozen lakes, creating different colour combinations for your balloon in the trees, and those hidden bonus areas that look like the inside of the Skullosaurus from Pooh's Grand Adventure. This easy-going and innocent nature of the game makes it feel like the V-Smile was almost designed around it, and it was simply a delight to play it again. The gist of things is that Pooh is having a party and fears he doesn't have enough honey for all his friends. Despite only having about 9 of them, some of which don't even like honey, but to each their own. So we control Pooh as he explores the 100 acre wood in search for honey. Now off the bat, Winnie the Pooh is a rather odd choice for an educational game because the main joke is that the characters don't know how to spell or read. But I mean, it works. And in terms of Winnie the Pooh games, this one sticks out solely because it's a platformer. Most video games based on this franchise are either activity packs or simplistic party games or that, but there are shockingly few platformers. So throughout the game you travel to various areas of the 100 acre wood taking part in various tasks while learning about the alphabet, numbers and colours and spelling among other things. Now the charm this thing radiates is purely due to it being a Winnie the Pooh game. In all the other games whenever the characters would tell me good job I felt very condescended to. When Pooh does it however, it makes me want to burst into tears because if he's proud of me that's all I need in life. Oh, now I guess it's only fair I say something negative. Like most V-Smile Smartridges, the game is very slow, and there aren't really a lot of challenges. It's mostly just walking in a straight line, collecting stuff, and having to jump over the occasional log. Which I get it's a preschool game, but I've seen other early education games that are far more involved. The levels taking place in the trees felt the most alive, with actual platforming and obstacles you really had to try and avoid. Mostly because the very idea of Pooh being injured was nearly too much for me to handle. Yeah, I can see why they don't make a lot of platformers starring this guy now. But at the same time, these criticisms help the game in feeling more like the source material. Because of the nature of Winnie the Pooh, a lot of the conventions that felt out of place in the previous games were right at home here. The British narrator in all the other games was definitely a choice, but here it actually fits because it's Winnie the Pooh. Because every facet of this game perfectly captures that tone and atmosphere. Look at this winter level, look at this leaf catching game, the world map is an actual map of the 100 acre wood. This game is simply too cute for its own good. Playing this was like a constant stream of serotonin and I had such a marvellous time revisiting it after all these years. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go watch Pooh's Grand Adventure and sob uncontrollably. I've had lots of fun playing with you. And those were a handful of Disney games for the V-Smile. Maybe we'll take a look at more in the future, but for now I am cutting myself off. So after going through all that, was I able to figure out why I was so drawn to this thing as a kid? Honestly, no. I mean, the controls aren't that great, and for most of the games the best I can say about them is that they function but I could honestly not tell you why I used to be so hooked on this thing. And I think that's okay. We don't always have to go through life trying to rationalise or justify the things we enjoy. So long as those things aren't hurting anyone, what's the issue? Maybe I wasn't able to fully recapture the feeling of playing this when I was five years old, but I still love this thing and I'm so happy I got to experience it again. Maybe it's the same with the holidays. I know I'm never going to feel about Christmas like I used to, and for the past few years I've been kind of faking it because despite how much I've changed and love the person I've become, there is always going to be part of me that wants to go back and is unable to accept the fact that I can't. Even with that though, there's still something about it. The magic of the season may have gotten dimmer over the years, but it's still there. I guess I've just gotta find a different way to feel it. Keep my old traditions alive as much as I can, but also allow myself the freedom to discover brand new ones. 
you know? Whether it's watching more recent holiday specials, or doing my best to spend it with the new people in my life as well as the old. It might take a few years, but I think it's worth a shot. Folks, thank you so much for watching this channel in 2022. Truth is, it has been a very turbulent year for me, where it seemed at every turn life got in the way of making content, which really stunted the growth of the channel in the long run. Nevertheless, I am still incredibly proud of everything I was able to achieve this year and can't wait to get things back on track in 2023. And whoever you are, wherever you live, whatever you celebrate, or don't, have an amazing holiday season. Well, I've got a train to catch, so until next time, I've been the Gladding Gladiator, and I'll see ya next year. A massive thank you to the wonderful souls, the Wacky Deli, Jason S, Zombie Rex, ELS Art, Tori Matson, Resplendent Nova, Red Mustached Alien, Jesse James, and Oliver's reviews and shows for supporting me over on Patreon. If you want to help out the channel, the best way to do that is by pledging to my Patreon, but of course, it's entirely optional. Thanks so much for watching, folks, and I'll see ya real soon.